Hi, my name is Mike Gaben, and welcome to episode 27 of my beta campaign. And in this episode, we are going nuclear. Yes, we're taking advantage of some of the unlocks that are taking, uh, making use of fission nuclear power and we're going to be putting them to some use. So in the second half of this video, what we have is a lander on its way to Drez that is going to be using the stock LVN atomic rocket motor, and we'll get to that soon enough. And then we have this thing, which I'll talk about very soon, and in between we do have a couple of other things that are going on, including um, the conclusion of that mission to capture that C-class asteroid. Um, but right here what we have is a nuclear generator which is on its way to the moon. Remember that I am building slowly a base on the moon and uh, because it's on the moon it spends three days on the night side of the moon as the moon rotates and that's not long enough for solar power. That's not, it's too long to have batteries simply power it so I'm going to be having a nuclear generator there. Uh, this thing's just a little bit too big to fit on the Samyaji, which is what I've been using to um, launch small payloads. It's just a little bit too wide. The docking pay doors are kind of narrow on that thing. So that is why you're seeing it uh, being launched on one of my more standard lifters. So let's take a moment to talk about these parts that are coming to us courtesy of the interstellar mod. So in the middle here, what we have is our nuclear reactor. It's only a 62.5 centimeter part. It's the smallest nuclear reactor that uh, comes with the interstellar mod and stuck to the top of it is our electric generator. Again, the smallest of the electric generators. And if you are using the interstellar mod, one thing you gotta be careful about is that these two parts have to be connected together directly with no parts in between them. Now let's take a look at our power management here. You can see that what we are doing, we're producing about 850 kilowatts of electricity in comparison. Um, the Gigantor solar panels, which are the biggest stock solar panels that you get, produce 18 kilowatts of electricity. So that gives you some idea of what's going on. And we're only using about 2.5% of that electricity. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, shut down this reactor. Yeah, I don't want to end up using it. So we're going to click on this toggle the control window. Let's see, where is that there? Toggle, there we are. Toggle control window. That brings up this window here. And you can see that at the bottom there, we're using up a fuel of uranium nitride. We got about 271 days of, of that nuclear fuel left. So we're going to shut this down because right now we're making no use of that electricity whatsoever. And then once we get Kerbals up there, we'll fire this thing up again. So just to give you just an idea of sort of how this has worked, what's the idea behind it is the uh, nuclear reactor uses uh, a uranium nitride pellet and it uh, fission reaction generates heat. Specifically, this one generates uh, 3.5 megawatts of heat. It also produces uh, depleted uranium as that uranium nitride is being used up. And uh, you do have the ability to breed that uh, that, uh, deplete, uh, that that depleted uranium. And what that means is that you can make it into other more useful and more powerful fuels. But uh, I'm not going to go there yet. That's something for a little later on in the game. So anyway, the heat that's being produced by this nuclear reactor is being gener is being transferred into electricity by the uh, thermal electric generator that is sitting there on the top. And that thermal electric generator is about 25% efficient. What that means is it takes about 25% of the heat that's being generated and converts that into electricity. The rest of that heat has to be radiated away and that's why I have been concerned with uh, putting on large radiators. So you can see there's large radiators on this thing that will be deployed uh, once I have this thing on the ground, especially once I fire up that nuclear generator. And I've also put radiators on anything that's going to be hooked to this thing um, because that heat will transfer around between uh, all these things that are connected together. At the bottom of the uh, nuclear generator, I have a transfer stage. You can see that. That's to get me to the moon and to do uh, the better part of my descent. And then there's actually a very small 
fuel can with a small standard chemical rocket um, that is connected to the very bottom of the fission reactor that will uh, do the final part of the landing. Uh, I decided that there... Uh, the interstellar mod does provide a variety of therm nuclear thermal and nuclear plasma rockets that uh, that work with the nuclear generators they provide to provide you some some pretty cool engines. But uh, I decided with this one, you know, I'm just going to keep it simple, and I'm just using boring old chemical rockets to get it there. Now, once I got this thing into low carbon orbit, it turned out that my landing site, which of course is going to be near the habitat module that I already landed on the moon uh, a few episodes ago, I found out that that was on the night side. So I ended up uh, time warping a few days and uh, got it to the point where the landing site is now just uh, at sunrise. So I'm going to landing it right at sunrise. So we're going to start to plan our descent here. It's a sort of normal thing. Um, I've done this a few times now. and We burn so that we're coming in nice and shallow just over top of our landing site. Now this ends up being a little too shallow. That's a little spooky. I think I'm going to be coming too close to the, especially the ridge of that crater as we, um, as we come in towards our landing site. So I decided to burn a little bit program, tweak this a little more so that, uh, it's not quite as nerve-wracking. So we'll just cut on over to the final part of our descent. Um, what I've done is I've select the habitat module for the eventual base as a target, so I have a nice target icon to aim at. Um, and I really haven't done this kind of thing too often. By the way, this is all running at two times speed, just to make sure you are aware of that. But I haven't done this kind of thing all too often, and, and landing at the target, although I have a lot of Delta V, so there isn't an issue with that, so it's a good thing I packed a lot of fuel with this, because I didn't do the most efficient touchdown as I could, and in fact, I could see here that I was running, I was going to end up landing a bit short, so I have to do a little bit of translating across, as you will see in just a little bit. I'm also a little bit confused as to whether I should be on uh, surface velocity or target velocity, I don't know. Maybe what I should do is just open up sandbox mode and just kind of practice this a little bit, get good at it before I end up doing something bad to one of these vessels. I don't know, but then again, I don't know, maybe this makes it a little bit more entertaining, so. I'll just let you watch my, uh, my approach here. And you can see it's not that different. It's kind of like docking in a sense that what I'm doing is I'm taking that retrograde vector and I'm kind of herding it towards the target icon, but I keep sort of messing up which way's up, which way's down, because we are going backwards and falling at the same time. And here we go. Now I can see I'm getting pretty close. You can see that the docking alignment indicator has popped up. That's because, I don't know why, there is a docking port on the Kanata base that I will probably never ever make any use of but that was one of the contract requirements is that it has a docking port on it so that's why that's popped up but I was too con too much concentrating on my landing to worry about that there we are we're about 200 meters from the surface and heading downwards not to get too mixed up. Whoa! <laughs> Come back! <laughs> and I finally decide just to put this thing down. And... Touchdown. So there we go. Let's see. Oh! 48 meters from the base. Uh, you know, maybe having it in around 50 meters from the base is probably a good idea. This is a nuclear reactor, but after all, so... Uh, Oh, this is all right. So what we'll end up doing is eventually we'll end up putting down a laboratory module because that is part of the contract requirement for this base. And then we'll send some Kerbals down here to finally put this thing together and set themselves up a home. But for now, it's time to head off to the second of our nuclear-powered vessels.
And here we have the Copernicus. And the mission is to put a lander onto Drez. Drez being the analog of the dwarf planet Ceres in our own solar system. And, and Ceres has actually been in the news as of this particular recording because a few weeks ago the Dawn spacecraft was put into orbit around Ceres and is currently in the process of finding out all kinds of neat things about that particular planetoid. Um, but this one is on to Drez. Now, actually, one thing I just want to mention before I go on about the Copernicus is uh, some people are probably noticing that I am well past day 365 of my first year. And just to make sure nobody is confused by that, I am using Kerbin days. And there are 426 Kerbin days in the Kerbin year. So, uh, yeah, these day numbers are going to get up to 426 before it rolls on over to year number two. But while we're watching this ascend, why don't we talk a little bit about Copernicus. So Copernicus, uh, probably a name that's more familiar to, to most people because he's the first of my European scientists to get mentioned. Um, born in the 15th century and champion of the heliocentric model for the solar system. Uh, what some people though might not be quite as aware about is the fact that his particular model was not all that accurate when compared to other models that existed at the time, models that were developed and refined, uh, models that were developed by Ptolemy and later refined by people like Samayaji and Aryabhata that I've, I've talked about in previous episodes. Um, his model was not quite as accurate because he was stuck on the idea that orbits had to be perfect circles and he wasn't going to introduce this idea of epicycles and all that kind of stuff. So when it came to predicting the motion of planets and eclipses and all those kind of things, his model didn't quite work so well, so it wasn't as compelling at the time as, as, as you might have thought. And in fact, this kind of helped him out, really, because when the Spanish Inquisition came knocking on his door, and other people's doors as well, for saying heretical things like, you know, that the, that the sun was at the center of the universe instead of the earth being at the center of the universe, um, he kind of got away with it just a little bit because, you know, it, his model just simply didn't work that well. And... A second thing that he did too is he kind of made the claim that well you know this is just uh, he, he took a line from Monty Python and he said well it's only a model and uh, and that's what he said he said this is just a mathematical model that I'm playing with uh, physically this is not necessarily the way things are and the church kind of left him alone and if you compare that though to what for instance Galileo was saying a little while down later down the road um, you know it's a very different things so the church for the most part left Copernicus alone for his ideas, even though he ended up having that kind of winning idea in the end. Okay, so let's talk about the vessel. Probably the most prominent thing on this vessel is the large dish antenna that's at the front. That, this is the largest antenna that I have, and the only antenna that I have that's capable of reaching all the way from Drez back to Kerbin. So, um, yeah, that's all. I, and, and in fact, that it cannot reach any basically any further than that. So Jewel and Elo are still out of communication range for me until I manage to upgrade the research and development center and unlock the next antenna, which is a big deployable antenna which can reach right across the, uh, the, the Kerbal system. Um, and I have two matching antennas uh, in two different locations actually. One's in keocentric orbit about Kerbin, and then the other is actually in orbit around the moon. So I will be able to communicate this thing once it gets far out. Now one funny thing with the nuclear engine that ends up happening is these cowlings, you have to sort of individually eject them. It's a little bit weird. If you don't do that, that engine will actually explode. And now you can get a look at that LVN atomic rocket motor. Um, this is a stock mo Whoa! Where the heck did that come from? How did that happen? It's like a boomerang cowling. Well, okay, well, at least it didn't hit anything, but I have no idea why that would happen. Uh, yeah, uh, KSP seems to be having some issues with physics and momentum, but... Oh, well. Anyway, back to the LVN atomic rocket motor. This is a stock part, and uh, the idea of it is that there is a... It's a thermal rocket, and the idea is that there is a fission nuclear reactor in the middle there, in that sort of part with the atomic radioactive symbol on it and what that thing is doing is it's heating up the propellant uh, exceedingly quickly and then that's allowing it to expel out the back and there have been rockets that have been designed this way and tested and uh, what and what it ends up doing is it produces uh, quite a lot more efficiency 
um, but not not as much thrust as the chemical rocket. So it's a, it's a balance between those things. But this ro this this engine is actually very very efficient, but still provi providing a um, a decent amount of thrust. Now, one thing that's a little bit weird is it still runs on the the liquid fuel, the uh, the liquid fuel and oxidizer tank that it has, and that's just because it's stock and Squad didn't want to get into introducing new fuel types. So, technically, though, this type of thermal rocket sh isn't burning the fuel. What it's doing is just heating it up and propelling it out the back. So it doesn't have to be something you can burn. There's no reason to have oxidizer or anything like that in it. Um, so anyway, uh, the interstellar mod, by the way, does provide some true thermal rockets that you can hook to nuclear reactors and have various different types of fuels that you can use uh, to propel them. So we'll set ourselves up anyway a maneuver node um, and get it out there towards Dres. Dres is a little bit of a trickier target. Obviously, it's much further out than Moho is. Uh, it's also quite a bit smaller, and it is not further out than Moho. What am I talking about? Further out than Duna. Um, uh, but it is a smaller target than Duna, so it's a little bit harder to hit. And in addition, the orbit is a uh, rather a little bit eccentric and a little bit inclined, so that makes it a little bit trickier. But after a little bit of playing around, I ended up getting my encounter. But that's not going to be for another six days. And in the meantime, we've got a couple of other things to do. The first of which is to visit the Arabata Sea and see if we cannot capture this C-class asteroid. And the Arabata A is finally closing in on its closest approach to Kerbin at which point we're going to do a retro burn, capture this asteroid, and uh, call this contract done. Um, I've decided to use the flight computer to execute this maneuver node. Even though the signal delay is barely more than a tenth, a, second, a tenth of a second, I really don't need the flight computer, but I don't know. I, I, I want to keep practicing with it and get better at using it because I am... Especially the uh, MOHO mission. That one's not very far away. It's only like... Uh, 20, 24 Kerbin days or something like that before that I get my MOHO encounter. So I do want to get better at using the flight computer, so I thought I would uh, use it here even though it's not really necessary. Uh, I was talking in the previous segment about Ceres um, and the Dawn spacecraft that's orbiting it around it and how it's collecting, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> I keep thinking in terms of KSP talk, and it's collecting science, but, uh, you know, more specifically, actually, there is, there is evidence now there of, uh, will be cryovolcanism, or, uh, and by that, what I mean is, or what's meant by that is, uh, it's, it's volcanoes, just like we have volcanoes on Earth, but instead of it being molten rock, what we're talking about is liquid water volcanoes. And, and, and this, this discovery that, you know, these objects that we formerly used to think of as just great big rocks are just, are more dynamic and interesting than, than anyone predicted. It, it's pretty exciting. And also that the solar system is, seems to be a lot wetter, a lot more water out there than, than what we used to think about. Anyway, as you can see, we are closing in on this burn and hopefully this will be the end of it and because if you recall this this vessel's been a glitchy mess for me and I'm really uh, really good to whoa well the glitchy mess continues you can see it kind of just pushed itself right into the asteroid and we we're having some trouble holding on to the node oh this is not good this is not good I turn on the RCS to try and see if I can push it back towards the node but that seems to be having pretty much no effect. I'm going to have to shut down this engine. Okay, the shutdown's not working. Like, the node's not cancelling. This makes no sense. It should be It should be cut. I should be able to cut the engine. I have a communication link. I should be able to shut this thing down. It's not getting anywhere. It doesn't seem like anything I do. Oh, dear. Oh, this is, this is really, really bad. We're just spinning around in circles here, burning fuel, and there's absolutely nothing I can do with it. Something's gone wrong. This shouldn't be happening. Oh, man. So I turned off the RCS because, well, finally the engine the engine just finally died. I turned off the RCS because I have a lot of monopropellant on this thing, and if I can get this thing pointing retrograde, you know, I can perhaps use monopropellant to get my capture. Yeah, all that spinning around, of course, accomplished pretty much zero. That's not surprising. 
But I do have a lot of monopropellant. I know it doesn't indicate that on the Kerbal Engineer over there on the right that I have any delta V left, but I do have quite a lot of delta V, but I can't get this thing to stop spinning. It just won't stop. I have no control of it whatsoever. And, ooh, it is making some terrible, terrible noises. Here, just uh, there's uh, there's uh, there's some more here coming up. I'll just I'll just sort of be quiet for a little bit and let you get a listen. Yeah. Those are not healthy sounds. Those are not sounds a rocket that's in good health should be making. Oh, man. Oh. Oh, and okay, well, that ended that. Well, any hopes that this mission had just went up. And I decided, I hate this. I hate when glitches take me out of the game. I mean, this thing's been in space for 43 days. I'm not going to go through this again. So what I did is I went back to a quick save. I just, I, I, I can't deal with, with, with glitches taking me out of the game like that. If I make a des design problem and it, and it causes the issue, that's one thing. But when, it, when it's a glitch that does it, that's, that's a different thing altogether. So what I decided to do is to just, I, I, took, I, I went back to a quick, my previous quick save, and uh, I'm just going to do this burn manually. And uh, you can still see that it is pushing itself into that asteroid. It's not particularly healthy, but now at least I can control the thrust. And I want to get this thing captured and call this mission complete. It still seems to be working. At least I can hold now that retrograde vector. And I end up turning on the RCS as well. I mean, I might as well get this thing over with as much as I can use up that monopropellant, get the capture, call is done, and hopefully never have to see this thing again. Well, onwards and hopefully upwards. This is Junksat 12, which I inserted into a polar orbit about the moon uh, a few episodes ago. And it was just a uh, one of these orbital insertion missions, and that contract is done. But what I did is I put a thermometer on this thing just on the chance that uh, I got another one of these uh, temperature scan missions where you had to t do temperature scans above certain points uh, on the surface of the moon and I got one of those contracts so it took a little bit of a minor amount of orbital tweaking to get the periapsis where I wanted it to be and to wait for the moon to rotate over to the correct location. Uh, one of the uh, waypoints I had to be below 10,000 kilometers and the other one I had to be above not 10,000 kilometers, of course, 10,000 meters. And the other one that had to be above 7,200 meters. So what I did is I just set the periapsis at around 8 kilometers and figured I could get both of them with just that one adjustment. This did end up having the thing skim across the surface pretty close a couple of times. Uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of like a little less than 3 kilometers from the surface here, but it never got too scary. I could have always have you know, done in some emergency thrusting if it looked like I was going to hit anything. But anyway, um, ended up picking up these two contracts, or these two, uh, these two parts of the contracts, these two waypoints without really any issues at all. The third waypoint is on the surface, so that's going to have to wait for a future landing mission. And that brings us to the transfer burn of the Copernicus to get it out towards Drez. So here we have the the, the uh, atomic engine all fired up at full thrust, producing about 0.7 g, uh, which is about three times the acceleration I got out of that ion dry uh, ion probe, ion propelled probe that I had uh, last episode. Even though this vessel is quite a bit heavier. Um, unfortunately, this burn has to happen on the night side. There's no way around that. Whenever you are thrusting out towards uh, the outer part of the solar system to orbits that are past Kerbin's orbit, you have to do your burn on the night side of Kerbin. There's no way around that. Uh, the one thing that actually makes this vessel quite a bit different from all of my previous interplanetary probes is that this is just a single stage what you see here really um all of this is there's no transfer all my other probes had a transfer stage to get them out 
to get the escape velocity, and then I used whatever the probe, whatever engine was attached to the probe body, uh, to to do the rest of the burn to get it out to whatever body it was going to. This is all being done in one go, so no staging is going to happen here. <clears throat> That's because I got a respectable amount of delta V out of this atomic engine, but also a reasonable amount of thrust. I mean, I got a lot of delta V out of the ion engine last episode too, but the problem is that ion engine produces hardly any thrust, so I wanted to have another stage to really give it its that kick out of the Kerman sphere of influence. But this one's got enough of a kick to it that I don't I don't need another stage. I've been talking a lot about thermal rockets and plasma rockets and just make sure sort of people get the difference. A thermal rocket, of which this is an example, this stock atomic engine, is, is a rocket that uses a nuclear reaction to heat up the propellant and propel it out the back. A plasma uh, engine Ionize, uses electricity to ionize the propellant and uses an electric field to propel that out the back. So the ion drive, the stock ion drive that you saw last episode, um, that is really a type of a plasma engine. And the interstellar mod comes with a number of plasma engines that work under the same principle, although you can use a number of different propellants with them, not just xenon gas. Um, but they're quite a bit more powerful in the, and they're quite a bit heavier as well. And they use... Um, an ungodly amount of electricity, some of them. So although they run on electricity, and theoretically you could run that with solar panels, in practice uh, they end up needing so much electricity that you're pretty much forced to attach a nuclear reactor to them. So those large plasma engines, and you'll be seeing them hopefully in some future episodes. Uh, I do have some plans for using them, but those large plasma engines usually end up being forced to become nuclear uh, as well. So anyway, we, we, we complete our burn and we'll take a last look at the Copernicus as it says goodbye to Kerbin. You might be noticing that I put a decoupler uh, between the atomic engine and the fuel tank there. Uh, that's because I plan on ejecting that once I'm done with it, which is going to be during the final stages of my, hopefully, my descent to, to Dres. That, that's the plan anyway. Uh, we'll see how it goes when we actually get to that. So I'm going to eject the engine because it's so long and so heavy that getting rid of it, I think, would be the best thing. And that way the landing legs will be able to reach the ground without any kind of silliness that I need to do. And uh, then I'm going to use the Landatron solid fuel rockets to do the final touchdown. And I showed you those Landatrons last episode. So that will be the plan, but that is going to be well over a year away. And I'm not even a year into this game yet, so yeah, that's going to have to be for some, an episode quite a ways into the future. But with that, this episode is going to come to an end, and we hope to see you next time.